tuned into Breaking the Mask of Depression with your host, Diva with Depression. Hey guys, welcome to Breaking the Mask of Depression with the, your host, the Diva with Depression. I hope you guys are doing well. I can't believe that it's the end of the year already. I'm, I, it's scary. Uh, you guys already know I told you that I freak out about stuff like that because time is going so fast and the holidays are here. So I hope everyone is staying safe and well. Um, no Google facts today because I have a special guest and I'm very, very excited to get into it. So uh, I'll, I'll save up some Google facts <laughs> for next episode. Um, you guys know how I'm always talking about reducing your intake and exposure to the news because, you know, it just disrupts your mind, your body, and your soul. Um, and I talked about it in my holiday episode um, because we are going through um, a stressful period. We have wars going on. We have um, race relations going on. We have illness going on. So um, my guest today is going to share with us how we can reduce the mental strain from the news and the world. And so I'm going to open the floor. I'm not even going to introduce her. I'm going to let her do it herself. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad that you came on. I'm so glad that you reached out, you know, when we were in the workshop together. Uh, you're my first Canadian guest, so I'm very, very <laughs> excited. <laughs> So you could share with us. So introduce yourself. Um, I'm Sandra, Sandra Hannabohm. Um, I am a journalist and I also started my own media company in 2022 called Twice As Good Media. It's a reference to Black excellence, twice as good. And it was really a reminder to me that, uh, that we don't have to be excellent to be accepted. And so it was kind of like, as my inner perfectionist kind of telling me like, it actually does, you don't have to be excellent. Right. Uh, you know, if you just do it uh, in a way that follows principles, good principles, it'll be twice as good. So I stuck with that. I am 31. I grew up between the east coast of Canada and the east coast of the United States. So I was born in Canada, um, moved around a lot uh, between the east coast and Toronto, which is, you know, just a, very close to the east coast. Right. And then the United States, I lived in Maryland and I have family in Virginia as well and uh, Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, those are good places to live. I have family in all those places. Mm -hmm. um, so you're in what area of Canada are you in now? Now I'm in Halifax, Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. Oh, okay. Okay. I wouldn't know either, but you know, I'm a geog I tell everybody I'm a geographical idiot. I don't know <laughs> north, west, south, you know, anything well, like that. <laughs> okay, let me let me go back a little bit because I I wanted to take a couple notes for today and okay. I've been thinking about um <laughs> I've been thinking about labels. Okay. And how when you meet someone, they obviously they're forced to make some assumptions about you, right? And what kind of what are the stories that I want to tell? So if you'd like to allow me, I can share a little story about a oh, hobby no. that I have. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, one of my hobbies lately has been um, tracing my genealogy, and I try to recreate the lives of each of my ancestors based on whatever I know about their life and the history of the time. Yeah. So, and I've been doing this for like about a year. It's, it's very, it's actually fun. <laughs> Maybe I'm a nerd, but, um, <laughs> so my eldest ancestor in the United States was an enslaved person who they named Jacob Purnell. He was born in Virginia and he was transferred to Natchez, Mississippi. And that's where he started a family when he was 17 years old. And then on my father's side, my father's uh, white and he's uh, German Canadian. Mm -hmm. On my dad's side, my great great grandmother, she survived uh, the communist Russian revolution. Uh, and <clears throat> because she was <clears throat> part Polish and German and living in an area that was sometimes occupied by Russians, sometimes occupied by Germans, 
she survived the revolution and then she survived the Polish massacres of 1943, where she lived in Volynia, which is in Ukraine. Um, so we're German, Russian, and Polish. That's just my wow. little, yeah, one of the stories that colors my universe. <laughs> wow, it's fascinating. And you said that um, your ancestor is from Virginia. Does it tell you what part of Virginia or is just Virginia? No, I mean, <clears throat> this person who is the eldest ancestor of mine uh, was reported as born in 1810, which wow. is just before uh, slaveholders were required to register. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know, um, and I'm a nerd too, but I know that uh, my last name is Hairston, and a lot of the Hairstons are in Danville, Virginia, um, mm -hmm. in that area. So that's why I said, when you said Virginia, I was like, let me ask, you know, mm -hmm. if that is, that. that's fascinating. My brother, my oldest brother started uh, doing the, the research for our family too. Mm -hmm. And so I know that it's very interesting. I said that one day I'm going to pay for the service and, you know, start yeah. looking it up. But um, you listen, you did work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's fascinating, though. And it's and you need to have it sidebar. You need to have it because you don't know what's passed down, you know, bio biology wise, genetics. You know, I always say that mental illness is genetic and environmental and so if we had that information beforehand, mm -hmm. we, you know, we may be better prepared mm -hmm. today. So I, th I think it was your comment about be what did you say? A geological. Oh, uh, did you, yeah. <laughs> the geological <laughs> idiot. <laughs> yeah. But I, it just brings me back to, you know, the move, like our, you know, the borders that have been drawn are not right. that relevant when you think about, you know, the movement of our ancestors through time was more, you know, north and south. Then okay. that line that goes east to west that separates the US right. and Canada. Yeah. Wow. So twice as good media. Um, and, and that was going to be one of my questions that I was going to ask is where you got the name mm -hmm. twice as good. And that was my first thought as soon as you told me the first time what it was is that we always have to be twice as good as the next person to succeed. Yeah. Um, which is not true. But you know, um what was your thinking into did you have any other name for your media company before you went with twice as good um i i didn't i i mean i had tried to think of a lot of uh names at the time i was taking an entrepreneurial journalism boot camp that was funded by um, the google news initiative um, and it was done by an organization called lion publishers which is actually mm -hmm. based in the united states um, so I was kind of pressed to come up with a name just so that they would be able to refer to me in my project. Okay. And they said, don't worry about it. It's not permanent. And I just ended up sticking with it. <laughs> oh, okay. I think that's excellent. That's an excellent name. Um, Thank you. It's sort of, you know, the irony in there. Yeah. Um, compared to what your wonderful business actually is. So how did you come up with the? Well, first I'll say, explain to us what mindful journalism is. Yeah. Um, so mindful journalism is is a framework that actually was developed by the authors of this textbook. Uh, the textbook is called it's long and academic. Um, mindful journalism in a digital news era, I think is what it's okay. called. Um, so that's actually a framework that was developed by communications professors to make journalism more constructive. Okay. And less less destructive. Um, and it's so it's a framework and it's also a practice to help journalists make sure that the the media they're creating mm -hmm. is uh healing and constructive instead of poisoning and destructive okay yeah. um do you think that um and this is i know that i didn't send you this but i was reading something yesterday that said that journalists today are and that's not all but the news reporting and the journalists today is irresponsible mm. and so do you think that it's irresponsible because of the quality or because not many um resources and news you know news channels and and newspapers are not thinking of being mindful if that makes sense you know, everybody wants yeah. the, you know, the the quick, you know, 
audience with the murder and the drama and all of that stuff. Yeah. So do you think that not being mindful is irresponsible? You know, I, I just think that the role of a journalist is it's very privileged. Right. First of all, uh, you have to be privileged to to be able to access journalism as a career. And then also being a journalist is a is a privilege because uh, you're telling stories and throughout history stories have a very important role in all of our lives. Right. So I can't accuse everyone of being irresponsible, but I would say that it's part of being responsible. Yeah, and taking that role more seriously and applying a growth mindset to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also it means looking at some of the tenets of mindfulness because mindfulness originates from Buddhism. Mm -hmm. It's actually just a very small part of this huge plethora of things, uh, a small part of the, the Eightfold Path. Right. One step of the many steps to, you know, nirvana in, in Buddhism. So it also means studying what are those things that they've identified are destructive? What are the things that they've identified are responsible, like compassion, equanimity, things like that? Right, right. And compassion sort of goes out the door sometimes because they're looking for, mm -hmm. you know, the, the headline grabber. Mm -hmm. Um, was it there does, any, yeah. Was there any, I'm sorry, was there any one thing that made you decide that mindful journalism needs to be discussed, needs to be um, put out in the forefront? Yeah, I mean, so <clears throat> when I started my journey, I just wanted to create a Black media platform because I just saw a huge lack of representation in news media, especially in Canada. Like when you compare it to the United States, there are hundreds of black news outlets mm -hmm. and there are not hundreds of black news outlets in Canada um, I would venture to say that I probably know um, at least half of them yeah. you know just okay. I have not traveled around searching for them they're just <laughs> easy to find and there aren't that many um, and uh, sorry can you repeat your question for me <laughs> was, <laughs> um, was there one thing that made you decide to put yeah. it to the forefront yeah so I wanted to just do a black media platform and then I started doing research and I saw that there was lack of representation in Canada. Um, but then I thought I, I want to get more specific and also wider than my local area. Um, I wanted to like create a platform that would definitely, you know, my goal is something that will outlive my own career. Okay. Um, and that's pretty ambitious considering the history of black press here because they're act it just in Nova Scotia where I live, there have been dozens of black press initiatives or ventures. Um, since the beginning of black history in Canada actually uh, and none of them are around today so mm -hmm. i'm looking at that thinking okay without being able to speak to each of them, why aren't they around today? Why don't we have this long institution of black media? And um, so I'm thinking about how to do something that's more permanent. And I realize that that means I don't wanna do something that's purely local and, uh, and I don't wanna do what everyone else is doing. So as I started doing my research, I found that there was a lot of black news outlets who just like every other news outlet, mm -hmm rely on clickbait right violence without context or explanation sometimes um ads so many ads you can't even read the article it's so frustrating <laughs> it, I, I close out it gets so annoying after a while yeah yeah so that's when i was like well how do i like why do i have a problem with this what's the name of the thing that i think is better and that's when I Googled, what's mindful journalism? And this textbook <laughs> came up. So I read the textbook and I was like, okay, I feel that this stuff, mindful journalism is especially useful for black communities and individuals and pretty much anyone who's non-white. Right. Yeah. Now, um, do you think that um, mindful journalism should be, pre should be more widespread? Because I was looking um, last, you know, last night when I was researching some of the your website, 
Mm-hmm. And I don't see that widespread in the U.S. So mm-hmm. has your concept passed along to other journalists in other parts? You know, like at first I found out about this obscure textbook. It was published in 2015. And then I'm like, where's where's the takeoff? Like what right. happened? Right. <laughs> Why isn't everyone doing this? Um, but as I started, I, I'm involved in a lot of journalism networks and associations and and I do all these workshops and webinars and things. And as, I, as I'm talking to different journalists, I'm realizing that there are actually organizations and groups who are pushing this, but they Ooh. aren't always calling it mindful journalism. Oh, okay. They call okay. it solutions journalism, okay. slow journalism, restorative journalism, reflective journalism. <laughs> okay. They're, they're really all different ways of uh, fixing it. Okay. <laughs> Okay. And they're all, you know, the, the most amazing ones, for example, Media 2070 mm-hmm. in the United States is an organization that has focused on uh, uh, reparations through media. Okay. They wrote this huge report on it. They, they do great workshops, Black Self-Care for Journalists. I did that one of those workshops. It was wonderful. <laughs> and <laughs> um, so, yeah, there are a lot of people trying to find ways to fix journalism and they're bringing in the same things they're bringing in mindfulness they're mm-hmm. bringing in uh, principles of restorative justice they're bringing in indigenous knowledge those things aren't in the mindful journalism textbook mm-hmm. but i think they very well could be and um, the textbook actually is an invitation to other journalists to take this up so i'm just accepting that invitation <laughs> okay now you, you said that there are not many um black news outlets there how has your organization and your um platform been received in canada yeah um so far it's been nothing but positive that's awesome and the question everyone has is what does that look like right Right. um so that is basically the mission of the whole company in my opinion is showing what that looks like and uh and educating people on on what that can look like yeah um, I'm always, like you heard me say in the beginning, and, and I've done episodes about this and talked about this. I used to read the newspaper every day, three different newspapers. Like when we had newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I watched the news. My grandpa started us watching the news in the morning, in the afternoon, the early evening, the late evening. Yeah. And, you know, I was trained. I on the way to work, I'd pick up one newspaper that I, we'd get to our desk and we'd switch newspapers amongst each other. <laughs> and I want to say um, right before the pandemic, or maybe sooner, I decided that I can't watch the news anymore because I was yeah. soaking stuff up. You know, like you're looking at it and you, you see uh, an episode with police brutality or you yeah. see a uh, domestic violence, you know, excerpt. And I take those things in, you know, yeah. like I'm an empath sponge. So I I stopped doing it. I stopped watching the news. Like I, I get my news from clips, you know, on whatever social media platform mm-hmm. or quick clips in my news, in my news feed. So what do you think um, is the effect that today's journalism has on our mental health? Yeah, I just recently heard a story from uh, another Black woman I was speaking to who was telling me how she grew up with uh, her parents playing, their thing was CNN. They didn't watch anything but CNN 24-7. And she would say, Mom, yeah. Yeah, and she would say, Mom, can we listen to something like music or? (laughs) (laughs) And it was, um, but it's this hypervigilance, right? Like, we need to know these things right. and it's actually people who are most affected by collective traumas collective traumas are things like 9 11 or right. a pandemic or gun violence and just the slaughter going right. on um those are collective traumas and so those are the people experiencing collective traumas who need to know right now what is happening and i i want to be the first to know because right. you know i can survive better that way the hyper vigilance um it's <laughs> but 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 now it's like we live in a world where the information is coming at such a pace in such a volume right that 
um, I actually just read recently that um, there were some people who tried to translate human processing power mm -hmm. into computer terms like gigabytes and mm -hmm. processing speed. So the amount of data that the average person consume, or no, sorry, this was the average knowledge worker. So people mm -hmm. who work on computers, you know, in offices, um, they are consuming more in one day than a lifetime for a highly educated person 200 years ago in wow. one day. Wow. Wow. You know, so now like where we used to, I mean, <laughs> I think about my ancestry and everything, there was a time when we weren't even allowed to read, it exactly. would have been very important to fight to get information. Right. And now it's completely the opposite. It's an effort to, to stop the flow and it does have an effect on you. Um, there was another study about they actually they um, looked at 911 and they also looked at the Boston Marathon explosions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> they found that people who consumed I think it was six hours or more of, of news about something that was a collective trauma, like 9 11 mm -hmm. and the Boston Marathon explosions. Um, they had much worse, worse health outcomes, specifically for the Boston one. People who consumed that much news were, in many cases, showed more uh, uh, precursors for mm -hmm. trauma traumatic stress. Wow and poor health outcomes like heart disease, um, things like that, more than people who knew someone who was there, mm -hmm. who was hurt, or someone yeah. who was, you know, close enough to be affected, someone who was around the corner, that person was not as shaken up as the people who consumed six hours of news about it that day. Wow, wow. that's something, that's something. Yeah, so and it's literally the food. more you consume, the worse your health is. Right. And I like the hyper vigilance part mm. that you mentioned, because that's another thing that we don't think uh, like a coping mechanism, yeah. you know, um, when you have uh, PTSD or you were raised a certain way, you don't really think about how that affects your upbringing. And you don't, I was talking to someone yesterday about um, childhood trauma and she was upset. She was not upset, but she was shocked at it, that it was showing up now mm. and I told her mm. when you when you are growing up there are things that you suppress mm. you hide in the recesses of your mind and you don't know what's going to trigger it you know it, you could sneeze the wrong way and that'll you know cause a flash a flashback yes yeah, um, so, so, so true it, you know we're watching you know all of this coming in and not realizing the statistics that you just shared you know, like we really, really are ruining our mental health. Mm -hmm. And um, I often talk to my daughters, uh, my, mostly my younger daughter, about how, you know, it's wonderful that they have access to all of this information 24-7. Um, so like if you want to do an essay at three o'clock in the morning, you just type up on Google and do it. Yeah. But the downside is, is that you're giving two-year-olds iPads. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're getting fed this crap, you know, 24 hours a day, you can get bullied 24 hours a day. And it, that's so traumatic. Yeah, it's, <sighs> it, it is like bullying. It, it's, uh, it's an abuse of right. attention. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And yeah. that, that in itself is irresponsible, you know, um, yeah. I, I, I'm, and I'm going to show my age now, but when you had Mike Wallace and, um, you know, different journalists, you know, back then, Walter Cronkite was, you know, a favorite. Um, they didn't do that. You mm -hmm. know, they, we weren't here for attention grabbers and, and clickbait, you know, they were really telling us the news, the ins and outs, and even telling us why it's important. And, mm -hmm. and now you no one thinks of that. And I guess that's where the mindfulness comes in. That's know? true. You know, my, my one criticism, no, probably not my only one, to be honest, <laughs> one criticism that I have about uh, how journalism was, was done in the past though, is that um, I think Noam Chomsky talks a lot about this. He was like, a, I mean, he's alive still, but he was like a computer the way he would consume news. 
so fast and uh, and he wrote a wrote and spoke a lot about how what we were seeing on the news back then was not all the news and right. we were getting the impression that this is everything important that there's worth knowing and there was so much that they weren't covering but you know the things that they covered um yeah they were more in depth there were no clicks they weren't right. desperate for ads so they they didn't have uh, headlines that had to be listicles so that people will click on them so that the ad right. dollars come in. Right. So much more pressure on outlets today. Right. And this is, you know, I didn't, this is a question that I sent you because I just thought of this. Um, in the podcasting community, you hear everyone talking about SEOs. Yeah. SEO, <laughs> SEO. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell you how many workshops I've already been to for SEO, how much is in my inbox yeah. about SEO. So when you are, um, when your platform is trying to make sure that mindful journalism and mindful news is in the forefront, how does that, uh, do you think about the SEO part of it? Oh yeah, you can't, you can't have a digital <laughs> business and not think about <laughs> SEO. And it's also really helpful when you're having conversations with people, meetings, and they're like, well, why do you want to call it that? And you're like, it's, it's, it's good SEO. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but you have to, so, I mean, as my training as a journalist was even, we had to worry about SEO and it seemed like something so, so trivial right. for us to have to worry about. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, SEO just means using words that people can quickly understand. Mm -hmm. And my role, um, I have a full time job and my mm -hmm. role there is as a digital producer. So the things okay. that I think about are how do these different platforms interact with each other and uh, are they getting the information that they need to see immediately? Mm -hmm. You know, right. so I think about that a lot. Um, <clears throat> but. I think about it so much that there are cases where I, I see how it's being used. And you know, it's 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 not being used with a consciousness. I was just getting ready to say it's deceptive. Yeah, it's purposefully deceptive. And right. like I understand that sometimes you're on YouTube and you see something that says, um, I'll just make something up. But um, you know, why you're too fat. We'll right. just say that. And then you click on it and it could be a video about how we actually should be more body positive. You're not too fat. That's just a perception and it could be all wonderful stuff. And that's just something people use so that you will click on it. Right. Um, but that particular kind of clickbait headline is feeding into, uh, I don't know if you would call it a neurosis, but it's feeding into a negative thing that you have shame right. about. That's why you clicked on it. So, right. you know, it's like, yes, put thought into SEO, put more thought into SEO, like right. more thoughtful, more reflective thought into the SEO. Yeah. Um, okay, I won't go on my SEO uh, thing. <laughs> um, I am starting to understand it more though. You know, at first I was like ignoring it, but then um, I understood how important it was to us to make sure that our businesses are out there. And I will say that, especially in the black and brown communities, podcasting and news, because our news doesn't automatically pop up anyway. Yeah. So yeah. we have to make sure that we are um, pushing it to the forefront and make sure everyone has access to it. Although I will say that one thing, how I, how I manage my platforms to kind of avoid that problem is that uh, in, 2024, I'll be kind of announcing this second podcast okay. uh, slash newsletter. All my newsletters are also podcasts because they have audio in them. Okay. And delivering it as a newsletter is one of the ways that I don't have to really worry about SEO. It's okay. going straight to your inbox. Okay. You know, I just have to worry about what my audience is interested in, not, you know, the broad audience of everybody because when you're talking about you, i mean why are we even talking about seo if you're not talking about thousands of clicks and right. then millions you know right yeah so my next question and we you know i want to say that we already discussed it <laughs> earlier and it could be you know my wording um but I, I want you to explain your thoughts um just i was wanting to talk about the race relations um 
the difference between what goes on here and what goes on in Canada. And um, I, I think part of it was what are race relations like in Canada? Um, because I want to know how does mindful journalism affect, you know, um, the mental health. I, the, we For the past two days, they've had a video of a man being arrested and the police officer tasing him for no reason. And she's tasing him and she's excited that she's tasing him. She's mm. like, ooh. And, you know, he he's crying and everything. Um, and so that's something that not only comes through the news, but it's in my Instagram feed. Um, mm. So I don't know. And I'm going to tell you that I'm, I'm totally ignorant to that subject in Canada. So in your own way, you know, you don't have to be specific, just, let, you know, discuss that in relation to the mindful journalism. Well, we, we have the exact same thing. I just saw a video the other day. Um, actually, it was a local Black news outlet. Um, <clears throat> and I try not to mention the name specifically when I'm talking right. about a negative example, because a lot in a lot of cases, they're trying to do good work and keep people informed. Right. So it's not about taking people down, but uh, a Black outlet had shared a video on Instagram of some people outside a McDonald's being just brutally beaten up by the police um, and said, the caption said, police brutality at its finest. Yeah, yeah. Um, where did this happen? Why did it happen? What are we supposed to do about it? What are the officer's names? What is that person's name? And I see the comments, people are asking those questions. And um, I, maybe one had been deleted, but someone randomly said, are you sure this is the one from Winnipeg? Because those aren't Winnipeg police uniforms. Okay. So what have we accomplished here? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Um, so we do have this the same problems here. Um, uh, but when it comes to race relations versus Canada and the US, I, I, I've been asked that before because I think people are always curious as someone who grew up as a dual citizen between Canada and the US, I've thought about it a lot. Right. It, it's an obvious question, um, but I've come to realize that I actually disagree with the premise that Canada and the United States are two different places. And okay. going back to the ancestry, if you think about it, if you kind of picture a circle and this the north is Canada and the south is the United States. There's a line in the middle that right. some colonialists decided was the line separating this whole continent, right. apparently, right. <laughs> this part of the continent. So in reality, look at the rivers. They go north and south usually. Right. Um, look at the movement of human beings from the south to the north. Mm -hmm. And in Canada, in ma many times we've sent enslaved people back to their so-called masters right through through a legal court system that right. said that they were so the canadian legal system recognized that these people mm -hmm. are property which belong to this person and sent them back to the united states so yeah. south north north south i don't think that for us you know if you really think about the context of human beings that horizontal line like cutting down the middle that's that's not true. It's really vertical lines up and down. The east coast of Canada and the east coast of the United States have more in common right. than, than different. Um, right. For example, in Nova Scotia, where I live, I kind of thought myself at 15 when I moved to, to Canada, finally, I couldn't wait. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I escaped racism and, and also Obama just got elected. So it's like <laughs> over, right? <laughs> and um, <clears throat> And I was very disappointed to find out that through through researching through a job I had, I was researching the the Nova Scotia legislature and black representation and female representation in there. And it was like, oh right, we've only ever had five black MLAs. There are more, you know, MLAs politicians. There are more men named John before Canada was Canada. Just men named John were serving in the legislature more than any women, any black people. At the time I was doing that research, there had been three provincial politicians for no black politicians for Nova Scotia. Oh. And I searched for a list. I went to the legislative library and I said, can I, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anyone on the list. You have like a list of 
historical figures, you know, black mm -hmm. figures who were politicians. And they said, we don't keep that information. And she kind of implied that that would be racist. So, you know, we have a color blindness issue here. Okay. We have the same issues with slavery. Uh, okay. Although we like to pretend that we didn't, we totally <laughs> sanctioned that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but in Nova Scotia, the very first black person in Canada who's recorded, Matthew da Costa, uh, landed in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And where I had just come from right. in Maryland is also a landing place for slaves. My right. people were Maryland and Virginia. So like, w did I go anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is something to think about. You know, and, and it shows that, uh, you know, we take everything at face value, what people tell us, mm -hmm. as opposed to what you just shared is the mm -hmm. truth. You yeah, know? and, you know, it's a, it actually was very dear to me, this completely false narrative that in Canada, there were just Black farmers. Right. That was so beautiful to me. Yeah. Because when I was in the States and I'm thinking, if you said Black farmer to me, I would say, you mean slave. That's mm -hmm. what I would say, especially, you know, from my history classes, I was taking right. not the best school system. Exactly. Um, and, and that was the first time I thought, yeah, a black farmer, just someone just growing food for themselves and just living life. And, mm -hmm. and they never had slavery, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can't help that that was a, a, a very comforting myth that I had in my mind for sure. Um, I'm going to combine the next two questions because I, I said, you know, that I sent to you um, that we were going to talk about. If you are asking people to be mindful about mm -hmm. the news and their journalism intake, how does that affect your job? Like, is there going to be um, job loss, job, job? Well, I don't think any job has security anymore mm -hmm. <laughs> today. So. Yeah. Um, okay. How does that affect the role of a journalist? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean, we experience massive layoffs every year in Canada and the US, I think. I think that's also true in the United oh, yeah. States. And um, so, uh, yeah, job security is already, we don't have any. Uh, we don't have any, no. So I see it as more um, recognizing and honoring the role that journalists play and can play um, in society by acknowledging their uniqueness. So for example, in my point of view, a, a mindful journalist would be transparent about what made them write this article in the first right. place? What were you thinking about that made you write this? And then where did that lead you to? Um, and so that would make room for a personal narrative. And that's a big no-no in journalism school, saying right. I or me. Uh, and if you do it at all, you would do it rarely. You surely wouldn't quote yourself, but um, that's something that I do because I'm here. I'm not, I'm not just floating above right. the whole situation. Right. Um, so really it's acknowledging the uniqueness of each journalist and their perspective and giving them the time that they need uh, because it is the 24 seven news cycle that has led to all of these layoffs. Right. <laughs> Right. But also as a journalist is, you know, journalists are, um, I don't really like this term, but news junkies and uh, mindful journalism is especially for those people, because it's those people who are most engaged with the. You zoned out, you faded out. Can you still hear me? Now I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. It's mostly people who consume a lot of news who are uh, sick of the way that it's done and sick of the news. So uh, journalists all immediately get the, the need for more mindful journalism because we struggle with it. We struggle with mindful media consumption because it's part of our job to know what's going on. There's a lot of pressure to know what happened five minutes before it happens. Right, right. <laughs> um, so, how it it actually helps us to to limit and and distinguish between our news sources uh for example i you know the 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 war and that whole situation with israel mm -hmm. and gaza uh 
I watched, you know, you can't avoid it. It was all right. over everywhere. Right. Even if I had turned off my phone, I would have heard about it from someone I know who right. has their phone on. And um, so when I'm consciously limiting my, my uh, exposure to violent and terrifying news, I'm thinking, where is the new information I'm getting? What, what is the value of the information I'm getting? Because yeah. I can see people talk about the loss of life, the injustice of it all, um, the people crying, the people screaming, the explosions, the buildings, uh, the, the bombs and all of this. And I still don't understand any better why this happened right? and, and what possible solutions are. So I actually limit that and say, okay, I'm going to turn that off now. I can come back to it anytime I want to. And honestly, I'm going to turn it off about the time when I start crying right. <laughs> because right. I don't know how you can consume that stuff without feeling it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's a sign to close it. Uh, and then I still am not avoiding it. It's still everywhere. I still keep seeing commentary about it. I still like someone's commentary and someone else's makes me really angry. Then I turn it off again. Then it's a whole new day. So right. it's just repeating that cycle. And in those spaces in between, my own actual curiosity about the event has a chance to explore. Right. So I picked up an old copy of the Bible that I had and started looking at these maps at the back. And it's showing um, what, what that area around <clears throat> the Mediterranean looked like in, in Jesus's time. Right. And you see Israel there. And then it hits me that on all of these news uh news platforms. I, they say this goes back decades. This is a conflict that started decades ago. You have to understand it's been a long time. It goes back a lot more than decades. Yeah. And I didn't learn about that from social media uh, clips about the news. Right. Um, we, we can go on and on. And it's interesting that you said the Bible um, after I was read at one night after Bible study, um, I I did something similar as I asked my brother, he, he's a pastor, um, you know, to explain, you know, the concept and, and everything, mm -hmm. how it relates to what's going on there and today mm -hmm. and the role in the Bible. So that's a whole yeah. nother episode. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, and that's not to come to a conclusion. That's not with an no. agenda before you start that. Right. It's just allowing your natural curiosity to have space to right. explore. Yeah. And and be informed, you know, so yeah. you can make a, your personal decision based on real facts and real research as opposed to clickbait. Yeah. Um, the next question, I guess, will feed into this um, two part. Give us some tips as the consumer about how to be mindful and protect our mental health and give us some tips if you can as a journalist and as a reporter mm. how you can be mindful um practice mindfulness while you're still being responsible for reporting these yeah events. i'm gonna flip my page here to my notes <laughs> where i wrote down some tips <laughs> um uh, actually, maybe quickly, I can answer the journalist question. There was, okay. um, I have been trying to, using the textbook, flesh out that framework in a way that's a little bit more digestible because the mm -hmm. textbook is extremely dry. <laughs> um, and on my social media, I'm on Instagram, um, I posted a um, eightfold path for journalists. Okay. So the eightfold path. I can't recite to you each of the eight things, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a path to nirvana, so to speak. Okay. Um, and that, you know, I, I try not to refer too much to religion because I really think that this works in a secular context, right. but it comes from a religion. So, okay. and a philosophy. So um, you can transpose that eightfold path into one that's for journalists. So if you go to my social media, which is at twice as good media on Instagram, you can find the eightfold path for journalists that uh, lists out specific kind of like a checklist that you can okay. apply to any work that you're doing. It's kind of like, think before you speak, here are a couple of things to think about before mm -hmm. you speak in this case, write or type 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But for consumers, I would say one big thing that has really helped me is customizing my notifications on all of my devices. And everybody has a different preference. Wow. Some people really like to check their email on their phone. Some people don't want to know if people are emailing them while they're out and about. They only want it on their computer. So I think it's a probably a good rule of thumb to just start experimenting with different notifications um, combinations between your devices okay. so that it's not distracting from your daily awareness of your surroundings. Right. My girlfriend, um, actually my girlfriend and um, a few of my girlfriends and my a cousin was saying that, you know, you have three devices, you have Facebook yeah. on all three and, you know, so they, they, you know, canceled out for two. I did the same thing because yes. I have three phones and I, I don't need all three of them to, to give me the feedback. Um, yeah, exactly. You're, you get one message and it's bloop, bloop, bloop. Right, so that, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's one thing is customize your notifications. And the goal of that is you're just trying to get rid of distractions from your daily awareness. You know, if you're okay. constantly being torn away from the task at hand, your life, you know, that's the thing we're trying to avoid. And then obviously limit the amount of time you spend on news each day. Right. I used to start each day listening to the radio because I found that just a nicer way to consume the news, but it did start to make me extremely paranoid. Yeah, so um, I don't listen to the radio in the morning anymore. If I listen mm -hmm. to it, I'll listen to it in the afternoon. Okay. I won't listen to it for more than an hour at a time. Okay. Um, generally good news hygiene, like fact checking, using reliable sources, following journalists that you trust. And if you have information from someone that you don't know, check check back on that you okay. know double check that um and i think the most important thing is to actually just notice when you're consuming some media that's causing an emotional reaction in you that's actually yeah. extremely difficult to just that know is, when <laughs> yeah that is very hard yeah especially I, if you don't identify with being in touch with your emotions yeah oh yes exactly yeah. um yeah. I remember I would I have generalized anxiety disorder and mm -hmm. I would always find these tips that are like when you feel nervous start breathing deeply count to 10 <laughs> and I'm like how do I know when I'm feeling nervous exactly. I'm not used exactly. to that <laughs> you, until you're knee deep in a panic attack and then you're like okay let me count yeah <laughs> big help <laughs> um so yeah just noticing when you're having an emotional reaction to something and then secondly to that is naming that feeling because we're not used to it so right. name that feeling and um, at that point that's probably your cue to shut it off for the day for a little while um, and just this is kind of just a caveat to limiting your intake mm -hmm. is limit your intake but go deeper okay. you know if if you so for if, just for example because Israel and Gaza is all over um, I see that I, I I see all these just just completely heart wrenching stories of innocent people, and I cry. Uh, but then I go deeper. I find a way to go deeper without the news. So right. I I start to get curious about um, just the geography of the area in general. Right. Like where are, exactly are we talking about? What uh why you know what are the origins of this history and everything okay. so if there's something that once you turn it off you're constantly thinking about it still then yeah go deeper do go deeper yeah. yeah yeah wow those are great tips as i turn Thank off you. all my notifications <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and it changes I'm like, no, I have too much stuff on my phone. I don't want right. it on my phone anymore. So I, I adjust it over time. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to look at that. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I actually heard another tip from, from someone else on Instagram who's like a, who's the <laughs> content creator. No less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, they, they were like, I don't, I don't consume any, so I don't go do any social media before 10 and after 10. Okay. Yeah, those were her times. I'm sure you could pick any time, really. Right. Um, but yeah, she's like, I start my day 
petting my dog and hanging out with the people I live with. And that's the way I like it. <laughs> but that's a good idea, you know, because yeah. I, I know me, like I, as soon as I wake up, I'm hearing ding, ding, ding and mm -hmm. vibrating and everything. And so I, I immediately, you know, throw my glasses on and start looking uh, before I even yes, yeah. put, you know, my contacts in. I'm, you know, squinting yeah. to um, this was an amazing subject. Um, I love, and, and I told you this before that I love the concept of the mindful journalism. Um, and I'm, I can't wait to see what you do with the platform, um, everywhere, you know, because I think that it's something that we all, you know, worldwide is something that we should be adopting. Um, and I, I don't even know what to say, um, but I, I love the concept. I told you I love the concept. It's something that um, I'm going to keep following, I, you know, I, not even just your newsletter, but now it's something that I'm really going to look into. And um, maybe even after, you know, I get it together, I'll have you back on, you know, so we can rehash it. Um, yeah. Tell us where we can find, well, I know you just told me that you have a, another podcast. So tell us the name of both of them and how we can find you. Yes. Um, so you can find me on Instagram at twice as good media, which is the one I said earlier. That's the main social media that I use because I limit my use to <laughs> one platform mostly. And I know that I'm supposed to be on all of them, but I got to do it works for me. Right. <laughs> um, and then the other way that you can find me is if you go to the number two XG for twice as good two XG dot CA because I'm in Canada. Uh, or you can also go to twiceasgoodmedia.com. Okay. Right now, my website is under construction, so you'll get a redirect to a landing page. But when you get to that landing page, you can sign up to find out when the new stuff is coming out in 2024. Okay. And one of those new things that's coming out is a membership platform. So the, the second podcast is actually for members. So for oh, people okay. who want to support the cause to fix journalism and bring more mindfulness into it, okay. especially for black individuals and communities. Um, so you can subscribe for free and you'll get one newsletter, which has audio in it that uh, that newsletter is called mindful black journalism. Mm -hmm. Pretty okay. obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I put that out once a month, very slowly. And um, the second is the one for members. That's one additional post a month. And okay. that's more in-depth conversations and interviews. I hope to have one with you as well. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> so that's just for people who want to know more about mindfulness and journalism. And you'll get that, um, you know, my prices are actually in Canadian dollars, but it's uh, $8 a month Canadian. That's not for, bad. Yeah. Or, or 80 a year. And again, you don't have to pay to get the content. That's just, if you want to go a bit deeper and hear these interviews in full, then then you can do that. Okay. And of course, um, I will have all of your information on the website and in social media so that we can follow you and, and keep up with what's going on. Yeah. But Sorry I if you, uh, I just, huh? can you hear that? Can you hear something in the background? No. Oh, okay, good. I was going to apologize. My <laughs> my mom just got here. <laughs> oh, um, earlier, right, like two, like twenty minutes before we got on, the the groundskeeper decided to start the leaf blower in the, the, the lawnmower, and I'm like, am I going to have to go in the closet to get? To yeah interview <laughs> yeah before we started i was like okay i told my mom i would be here all day and then she's gonna show up right when i'm recording <laughs> <laughs> listen it just tells people that we're living life we're doing this but our life still goes on yeah that's life baby <laughs> um i want to thank you number one for reaching out to me and i'm honored that you uh wanted to have the discussion and and come on my platform i want to thank you for coming on today um i know you're busy um, so I thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your platform with us. Um, and like I said, this is something that I'm going to make sure that I keep in the forefront because we have to, I, I always tell people you have to protect your peace. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the mindful journalism is one of the steps that we need to take, especially in the world we live in today to protect our peace. So thank you so much. Um, pronounce your last name. Oh. <laughs> 
Hannibal. Hannibal. Okay. Sandra <laughs> Hannibal. Okay. Yes. Thank um, you. I will have everything on my website. You can just send me the information. I'll put it on my website and my social media. So everybody can stay in touch. Great. Guys, thank, thank you. you so much for listening. We did go longer today. Uh, and you know me, once I start rattling on, you never know how long it's going to go. Um, but this is something that I believe that you guys can use going forward to try to protect your peace. Um, if you don't already, go to divawithdepression.com and sign up and subscribe. Uh, you guys know the drill. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and uh, Twitter. Uh, not much on Twitter, though. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and you can reach out. And like I said, look out for the notes and you will be able to get in touch with Sandra and Twice as Good Media. Take care, guys. Mm -hmm. oh, please, guys, please, please take care. I mean, I've talked to you before the holidays but I want you to remember to protect your peace. Thank you. Thank you.